following lecture is aimed for senior dental students, interns, dental trainees, oral surgery and oral maxillofacial surgery residents, as well as master and doctor degree candidates. In memory of my late parents, may almighty merciful God rest their souls in heaven and peace. So first of all, please allow me to give a brief bio about the speaker. My name is Muhammad Ahmed al -Shulkami. I'm currently a professor and the chairman of the Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery Department at the Faculty of Dentistry, Suez Canal University in Ismailia, Egypt. Actually, Ismailia is one of the most beautiful cities in Egypt. It is located around 80 miles to the eastern of Cairo, overlooking the Timsah or Crocodile Lake and Suez Canal. Ismailia was founded by and named after one of the great rulers of Egypt in the 19th century. He was Ismail Pasha or Khadiw Ismail. He was the one who did the opening ceremonies of the Suez Canal in 1869. Beautiful scenery is always seen in Ismailia. You have a greenery landscape overlooking lovely blue sea, and I think it's worth visiting. And that's the place where I work. This is the Faculty of Dentistry Complex. It's comprised of three main buildings. I'm also the professor and the supervisor of the Oral Maxillofacial Surgery Department at Faculty of Dentistry, Sinai University, Kantara Campus in Ismailia. I also worked as a part-time associate professor at MIU University and MSA University for several years. I'm a visiting professor at the Faculty of Dentistry, Beirut Arab University in the Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery Department in Beirut, Lebanon. Our topic for this lecture is the management of maxillofacial infection, where we are going to discuss the mandibular fascial spaces, the second part. Our main ILOs are knowledge of different mandibular spaces, understanding the different routes of infection for each space, understanding the clinical significance of each space, Last but not the least, knowledge of the clinical picture and the management or surgical incision for each space individually. So let's first know what are the muscles governing the spread of infection when it comes from the mandibular teeth. We have the mylohyoid, the masseter muscle, medial pterygoid, superior constrictor of pharynx, and last but not the least, orbicularis oris. Furthermore, we have the depressor anguli oris muscle, or sometimes it is called the triangularis, the depressor labiae inferioris, or it is also referred to as quadratus labiae inferioris, and last but not the least, the mentalis muscle. And now let's take a brief tour to show the diagrammatic presentation of these muscles. The first red arrow points to the masseter muscle and the second one points to the medial pterygoid muscle. And these two muscles, they are on either side of the mandibular ramus, and they form what is called the tergomasseteric sling. And with, along with the mandibular ramus, they form the submasseteric space in between the masseter muscle and the lateral uh, wall of the ramus. And on the other hand, medially, between the medial pterygoid and the medial aspect of the ramus, we have the tergomandibular space. The third arrow points to the superior constrictor muscle of the pharynx, which forms the lateral wall of the pharynx, and along uh, this muscle we have the parapharyngeal spaces, the lateral pharyngeal space on the lateral aspect of the superior constrictor of the pharynx, and the retropharyngeal space is the one which is located behind the pharynx. On the left hand side we can see a diagrammatic representation of the lingual or the medial aspect of the mandible, showing the mylohyoid line. And you can notice that the mylohyoid line goes upwards or superiorly as long as we go towards the posterior teeth or the molar teeth. Which means that teeth like the second and the third molars having their epices mostly located below the attachment of the mylohyoid muscle. And infections from such teeth when they erode the lingual cortical plate of bone will eventually lead to submandibular space infection below the attachment of the mylohyoid muscle. On the contrary, anteriorly, when the premolars or the first molar might be involved, lingual 
erosion in the cortical plate will lead to sublingual abscess. On the right hand side, you can see the attachment of the buccinator muscle to the buccal cortical plate of bone opposite to the maxillary molars and the buccal cortical plate of bone opposite to the mandibular molars. And accordingly, if the infection erodes below the level of the attachment of the buccinator muscle, it is going to lead to a buccal space infection. If it erodes above the attachment of the buccinator muscle in the lower jaw, it is going to lead to a buccal vestibular space abscess. And here come the muscles of facial expression governing the spread of the infection in the anterior region. We are going to find them labeled in green. On the right hand side, we can see the depressor labii inferioris muscle or the quadratus labii inferioris. In the middle, we can see the triangularis muscle labeled in green or the depressor anguli oris. And on the left hand side, we can see the mentalis muscle. And according to the order of infection with respect to the offending tooth, we can classify fascial spaces into primary or secondary. Where the primary fascial space is the infection spreads directly from the offending teeth to this space, which is lies in vicinity or anatomical vicinity to the offending teeth. On the other hand, the secondary fascial spaces, the infection spreads further to these spaces from the primary one. So to recapitulate the primary Fascial spaces take the infection directly from the offending teeth and through their communications to other fascial spaces, the infection spreads to the secondary fascial spaces. And now let's go through an overview of the different mandibular fascial spaces related to infections spreading from the mandibular teeth. First of all, according to the anatomical location, we are going to divide them into the space of the body of the mandible or the perimandibular spaces or the masticator space. The perimandibular spaces are the submandibular, sublingual, and submental spaces, and the masticator space are the ones who are located in or around or between the different muscles of mastication, like the submasseteric, pterygomandibular, superficial, temporal, and deep temporal space. On the other hand, according to the order of infection, directly from the teeth, or the infection is spreading from a, a primary a space to the, a, 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 a secondary space, we can Furthermore, divide them into primary mandibular spaces like the submental, the buccal, the submandibular, and sublingual. And furthermore, the secondary fascial spaces are the masseteric, pterygomandibular, superficial, and deep temporal, lateral pharyngeal, retropharyngeal, and prevertebral. However, in some instances, some spaces might not like the secondary role and they might present themselves as the key prime player or the primary fascial space where the infection first invades. And of course, this depends upon where the infection comes from. Here we can see the masseteric or tegromandibular or even the lateral pharyngeal might be regarded as primary mandibular spaces. When the lower uh, wisdom tooth or the uh, lower third molar is involved, particularly when it is mesoangularly or horizontally impacted, we can see on the left hand side of this panoramic view, the red arrows are pointing to a large, huge cavity distal cavity in the lower second molar and a very large carious cavity exposing the pulp in the lower horizontal impact third molar. And so according to the direction of the wisdom tooth, whether it is horizontally or mesoangularly impacted or vertically, and the depth of impaction, whether it is partially impacted or uh, a little bit superficial or a little bit deep in the muscle, and furthermore, the lingual or the buccal deflection of the roots itself, it will dictate where the infection will go further. The lower third molar is regarded as the jack of all trades. It can go to different destinations, whether it depends upon the infection is coming from a pericoronal infection or a periapical infection. On the right hand side, we can see a coronal section showing the different destinations where the infection can go from the lower third molar to the sublingual space if the pericoronal infection uh, gets above the level of the myrohyoid muscle or into the submandibular space from a pericoronal infection or a periapical infection. On the buccal hand side, we can see it, a pericoronal infection might lead to a buccal space infection or a, a vestibular space infection, and the periapical infection will definitely get into a buccal space infection. On the left hand side, we can see a, a horizontal or axial section showing the different posterior destinations from the lower wisdom tooth 
it can go in the subacetic space or furthermore lateral to the master space where it can dig through medially through the tergomandibular space or even more far medially medial to the medial trigoid muscle into the lateral pharyngeal space. What are we going to discuss talking about each space? First of all, we have to know the anatomical boundaries of this space and accordingly, we, we should know the routes of sources of infection for this space. Then, we will discuss the clinical significance or clinical relevance through the following points, the contents of the space and the communications of this space to the neighboring spaces or the secondary spaces. And last but not the least, the clinical picture of involvement of these spaces. And last but not the least, we are going to go through the management or particularly the surgical incision of these spaces because the management of course is a more broader term including strategic planning and strategic management of the case as a whole and first of all we have to deal with the cause of the infection either to with the endodontic treatment or surgical extraction so removal of the cause is one of the key uh, features or key factors in managing the cases of infection and it will be discussed in a separate video and now let's focus on the topic of this lecture the masticator space which is a major term comprising of four spaces the submasseteric the tergomandibular and the temporal space with both its superficial and deep temporal compartments let's start with the submasteric space is it is a potential space in the face it's located over the angle of the mandible and it's paired on each side it is exactly located between the lateral aspect of the ramus of the mandible and the medial aspect of the masseter muscle the infection in this area occupies a very limited potential space between the lateral border of the mandible and the masseter muscle leading to severe pain and this is not a fascia line space and accordingly the infection will be in direct contact with the masseter muscle and usually it induces intense spasm of the muscle resulting in severe trismus the patient cannot open his mouth completely so what are the anatomic boundaries of the masseteric space the anterior margin of the masseter muscle bounds the space anteriorly and the parotid gland bounds it posteriorly, the zygomatic arch superiorly and the inferior border of the mandible inferiorly. And this is the diagrammatic representation of an axial section through the ramus of the mandible and the associated muscles and the parotid gland posteriorly and the lateral wall of the pharynx with the, with the superior constrictor muscle of the pharynx. Here you can find the arrow pointing to the parotid gland which is the posterior boundary of the space and the second arrow pointing to the anterior boundary of the space where it communicates with the buccal space anteriorly. On the medial aspect we can find the lateral aspect of the mandibular ramus and laterally it is bounded by the masseter muscle. What are the communications of the masseteric space? As previously pointed on the axial section figure, it communicates with the buccal space anteriorly, while posteriorly it communicates with the parotid space as well as the tergomandibular space, going around the posterior margin of the mandibular ramus to its medial surface, whereas superiorly it communicates with the superficial temporal space. However, the contents of the masseteric space are the masseteric artery and vein. What are the sources of infection? The masseteric space usually it comes from odontogenic infections related to the lower wisdom tooth particularly partially impacted where it is mesoangular or horizontal impacted lower wisdom tooth where the epices of such tooth lie very close to the space also compound angle fracture can cause infection in the submasteric space the signs and symptoms of the submasseteric space abscess include marked and severe trismus due to involvement of the masseter muscle and the severe pain there is also swelling in the region over the masseter muscle the submasteric space also may, may be got involved from infections from other spaces particularly the buccal space and sometimes it is associated with 
mandibular compound mandibular angle fractures which leads to infection of such space. On the other hand, the submasteric abscesses are relatively rare, and in some instances they might be confused with parotid abscess or parotitis, which tend to be more chronic. And to tell you something to differentiate between the parotid involvement and the submasteric or the pterygomandibular abscess, usually the involvement of the par parotid gland leads to elevation of the ear lobule, which is can be clearly compared to the other side. What about the management and surgical incision of the submasteric abscess? It's usually done intraorally and sometimes accompanied by extraoral incision if you feel that the intraoral incision will not be able to evacuate the abscess completely. This is the intraoral incision. It is carried out at the anterior border along the external oblique ridge at the anterior border of the ramus. And this is the extraoral incision around the angle of the mandible. And of course, the intraoral incision is more preferable to avoid facial scarring. The pterygomandibular space it is a paired space on either side. It's a potential space. It is located between the medial pterygoid muscle and the medial surface of the ramus of the mandible. On the right hand side, the upper figure, we can see the mandible removed part of the ramus of the mandible removed and you can see the medial pterygoid muscle on the medial aspect of the mandible attached to the angle of the mandible medially. The pterygomandibular space is considered one of the four compartments of the masticator space which are the submasteric pterygomandibular and the superficial and deep temporal spaces. What are the atomic boundaries of the pterygomandibular space? It is bounded anteriorly by the posterior border of the buccal space whereas the parotid gland bounds it posteriorly. Superior it is bounded by the lateral trigoid muscle and the inferior it is bound by the lingual surface of the inferior border of the mandible. And this is a diagrammatic representation of an axial section through the ramus of the mandible and the surrounding muscles and the parotid gland which is pointed to by the red arrow. It is the posterior boundary of the pterygomandibular space and this is the anterior aspect of the anterior boundary of the space pointed to by the red arrow where it communicates with the posterior border of the buccal space. Medially, it is bounded by the medial pterygoid muscle because the space is superficial to the medial pterygoid muscle and laterally it is bounded by the medial aspect of the ascending ramus of the mandible. What are the communications of the pterygomandibular space, it communicates with the buccal space anteriorly and to the lateral pharyngeal space and the peritonsillar space medially around the medial pterygoid muscle and to the submasteric space laterally around the ramus of the mandible and it communicates posteriorly to the parotid space. Superiorly, it is communicated to the deep temporal and infratemporal spaces. What are the contents of the pterygomandibular space? Actually, the contents are very important and very relevant to the dental practitioners. We have the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve with two most important branches, the inferior alveolar and the lingual nerve. We have the inferior alveolar artery and vein and the sphenomandibular ligament. On the right hand side, we can see a diagram representing the needle which penetrates this space usually, and around 50% of our practice depends upon using or giving the inferior alveolar nerve block. So, usually, we penetrate the vaccinator muscle and we go with our needle every day in everyday practice through this space. What are the sources of infection for the pterygomandibular space? Usually odontogenic infection spread to involve the pterygomandibular space. The most common teeth involved are the mandibular second and third molar teeth <coughs> and more specifically the third molar tooth, particularly if it is mesoangularly or horizontally impacted. And on the right hand side we can see the axial section where the infection, if the roots are a little bit deflected lingually, the infection can reach the pterygomandibular space directly as a primary space or if 
there is involvement in the buccal space infection or other infections as primary spaces, it will eventually really reach the pterygomandibular space as a secondary space. Infection can reach the pterygomandibular space also during injection of the inferior alveolar nerve block where the needle touches the bone inside this space. And I in remember a case back in the 90s which came complaining of severe trismus and this was a couple of weeks after trying to do endodontic treatment in a palpitis severely inflamed lower first molar. The patient took about four or five multiple injections or nerve blocks trying to calm the pulp to be able to do pulp extirpation. Most probably this led to hematoma inside this space and the hematoma got infected and on doing a CT, axial CT, we saw a collection of pus in this space and the patient was relieved after incision and drainage of the pus from the pterygomandibular space. So please, this can be an iatrogenic source of infection during carrying out multiple repeated injections or uh, contamination during inferior alveolar nerve block injection. However, this space shows less trismus in comparison to the masseteric space. And although the entity of having an iatrogenic infection through the pterygomandibular space is rare, yet if you see it once in a lifetime or once in your practice, you can never forget it. Also, this space derives its clinical significance from being the space if you are giving the inferior alveolar nerve block and needle breaks, the needle will remain in this space. And accordingly, you have to dissect further to try to retrieve this broken needle. There are also two other important issues regarding the inferior alveolar nerve block in this area. Owing to the contents of this space, it has several blood vessels, so there's high vascularity in the area and there's high risk of intravascular injection. So this is why aspiration is mandatory. Another possible communication is passing the needle too far and too deep beyond this space and passing through the pterygomandibular space to the parotid gland found at the posterior border of this space and giving the injection within the substance of the parotid gland. It will affect the five terminal branches emerging from the anterior and inferior aspect of the parotid gland which are the temporal and the zygomatic and the buccal and the marginal mandibular and the cervical and this will lead to transient facial pulse. Another issue regarding the clinical significance of this space, if you look on the figure on the right hand side you might find a wisdom tooth displaced into the pterygomandibular space and this usually happens during extraction of maxillary wisdom teeth where faulty and erroneous technique might lead to displacement of this wisdom tooth into the pterygomandibular space. And last but not the least, this space might be involved in mandibular angle fractures, particularly compound angle fractures, which might lead to infection of the pterygomandibular space. The signs and symptoms of the pterygomandibular space inf infection include trismus, however there is no externally visible swelling like other facial spaces. The patient will also complain of dysphagia and on looking intraorally there will be a swelling and erythema at the anterior tonsillar pillar area just medial to the ramus of the mandible and there is deviation of the uvula to the unaffected side the airway also will be compressed or compromised on the left hand side you can find severe market trismus the patient cannot open his mouth except for a few millimeters and on the right hand side you find a large swelling on the medial aspect of the mandible and deviating the uvula to the unaffected side Surgical management is done by an intraoral incision along the anterior border of the ramus of the mandible. And on the right hand side figure you might, might find the direction of the introducing of the hemostat to drain the abscess. The curved arrow points to the lateral pharyngeal space while the straight arrow points to the pterygomandibular space. And here is the incision at the anterior aspect or along the external oblique ridge or maybe just medially you just put your hand on the external oblique ridge to localize yourself and then you go medially with the hemostat to evacuate the pus. On the lower left figure 
you might find the extraoral incision for the pterygomandibular or submasteric space abscess along the angle of the mandible. And here is a very nice diagrammatic representation of all the fascial spaces related to the mandible and the pharyngeal area. Here this is the transverse section cut at an oblique angle. You can find the direction of the cut at the upper figure. And on the lower figure, you will find the names of the spaces highlighted in light yellow color. And here you will find the perimandibular spaces, the sublingual, the submandibular, and the submental space. And posteriorly, you can find the spaces around the ramus of the mandible, the pterygomandibular space medially between the medial pterygoid muscle and the ramus of the mandible, and the masseteric space laterally between the ramus of the mandible and the masseter muscle, and both parapharyngeal spaces around the pharynx, the lateral pharyngeal on either side of the pharynx, and the retropharyngeal behind the pharynx. Furthermore, you'll find the prevertebral fascia and the alar fascia, and between them there is the danger space or the alar space, and posterior to the prevertebral fascia, you'll find the prevertebral space, which is anterior to the cervical vertebrae. And here we come to the deep temporal space. It's a potential space in the side of the head. It is a paired space which is located deep to the temporalis muscle. The inferior portion of the deep temporal space is also termed the infratemporal space. What are the anatomical boundaries of the deep temporal space? Superiorly, we have the superior and inferior temporal lines, and inferiorly, the infratemporal crest and the zygomatic arch. It is bounded medially by the sphenoid bone and laterally by the temporalis muscle. The deep temporal space communicates laterally with the superficial temporal space and inferiorly with the pterygomandibular space. It also directly communicating to the infratemporal space inferiorly and medially and it contains temporalis muscle fibers. Last but not the least, the temporal space. It is posterior and superior to the masseteric and the pterygomandibular spaces. Usually the temporal space is bounded laterally by the temporalis fascia and is bounded medially by the skull bone. It is divided into two portions by the temporalis muscle, the superficial and deep temporal spaces. The infection in these spaces are more uncommon unless the infection is overwhelming and usually these two spaces act as secondary spaces. The infection does not come directly from the offending teeth. The sources of infection, as previously mentioned, these spaces are regarded as secondary spaces. They do not receive the infection first from the offending tooth, but usually involvement of the maxillary third molar, which will lead to infratemporal space infection, and in turn, the infratemporal space infection which is going to spread further to the deep temporal and superficial temporal spaces. Also, other involvement of the other masticator space like the pterygomandibular and the masseteric space might lead to secondary involvement of the temporal space. For a space which is firstly involved after infection of the maxillary third molar, it is the inferior portion of the temporal space and it is contiguous with the deep compartment of it. When the temporal space is involved, there is evident swelling over the temporal area. And if the superficial compartment is singularly involved, the swelling can be dramatic. On the right hand side, we can see the upper figure showing a large swelling over the temporal area, and the lower one showing a little bit localized swelling over the temporal area. This is one of our cases at Swiss Canal University, oral maxillofacial surgery department. It came as a secondary infection after infected oral anterior communication. And as previously mentioned, any compartment of the masticator space when involved in infection, we can find a key clinical feature, which is trismus. What about the surgical management and the surgical incision? You can find the horizontal incision for the temporal space. However, this might not evacuate the space completely. <coughs> and in case you have a, a good fluctuant collection of pus, you might resort to the most dependent area of this swelling and incise it to drain the pus completely. And let me give you one special quote about happiness by Marcus Aurelius. The happiness of your life depends on the quality of your thoughts. And finally, I would like to thank you for your kind attention.
Thank you so much.